Praise the Lord that we're going to have four, six baptisms today. Wow. <laughs> you, know, I mean, you know, Yell, I know she's six, but she's been asking a lot. And she understands, so I can't take it away. I know some preachers will wait until they're about eight, but I don't see that in the Bible either. I don't really see it. So, you know, she's asked, and she's not asked once. She's actually, she wants to get baptized. And she, even after church again on Wednesday, she knocks on my bedroom, Daddy, you know, she wants to, can I come in? And then she wants to, she asked. And she knows that, bapt, you know, that baptism doesn't save. I've asked some questions there. Obviously, you have to understand, they understand as a child. You know, they don't understand. They don't, she won't be able to get to deep theology, if you know what I'm saying. But she understands that Jesus saves. And when she did get saved, and I believe she's saved, you know, I know attending, I'm one of those type of people that don't take it for granted. I do question. But shortly thereafter, she came up to me with a Psalm 54, and verse 1. You can turn there if you want. Let's turn there. And she goes, look, Daddy. So I have to, you know, I'm going to put that in the Lord's hands. You know, I can't, you know. The Bible says, despise not the little things that believe in Zechariah. We'll turn there as well before I get to the message. So 54 in verse 1. And this is what this is, uh, I believe, did Brad put that on the bookmark, that verse? Yeah. Okay, it says this. So this is the verse that the, the Lord gave her. <laughs> I believe that. That was, uh, that was a year ago. Save me, O oh God. It was a year and a bit. I think it was, was Dr. Lamore alive at that time? I think it may be, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was even you know, a year and a half ago. Save me, O oh God, by thy name, and judge me by thy strength. Hear my prayer, O oh God. Give ear to the words of my mouth. Save me, O oh God. Well, God gave her that. She came up. No one, no, one, uh, no one else prompted her or anything. I certainly don't coerce them into this. I can tell you that much. Even with baptism. And I certainly don't coerce them into salvation. Absolutely not. But I also tell my children, because one of your siblings claims to be saved and has made that profession of faith, don't feel pressured to say you're saved if you're not. Don't feel pressured. We're not into, like, fitting in here. And let's go to Zechariah 4, verse 10. The question is asked here. And certainly the first part of this verse I'll read. For who hath despised the day of small things? For who hath despised the day of small things? Amen. Amen. Don't take it for granted. I know there's some preachers that go overboard and they won't even, they don't even, there's some actually that believe that children, they don't believe that children can make that profession of faith. And actually, I don't necessarily believe that because Jesus said, said, suffer the little children to come unto me. Suffer. So that means he can. And especially if you're brought up in a Christian home, you've got the Bible, absolutely. They won't understand the gospel and be able to explain it like you and I can. By the way, when I got saved, I couldn't explain the gospel. I had people uh, argue with me, or actually there was one person about that tract, this was uh, my life, there's no gospel in there. What do you mean there's no gospel? There's lots of ver verses. Look, you don't have to quote 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4 to give a gospel presentation. Do you realize I can preach a message today from the Old Testament alone and give you a gospel presentation out of it? I can preach Jesus Christ from the Old Testament alone and be able to give you a gospel presentation. In fact, during my dad's funeral, I did just that. Yes, I did cross-reference with the New Testament and showing the fulfillment of the Old Testament, but I preached the message out of the Old Testament. So it's kind of nonsense. And I think Luke knows where I'm going with some of that. <laughs> yeah, with that. Actually, he knows, yeah, because there are some that believe in Acts 2 that Peter preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as a murder case. You hearing that? Nonsense. No, he was preaching it as a means of salvation. Obviously, he was going to use, obviously, you know, 
Uh, actually, no, let's go to Acts chapter 2. I'm kind of getting a little off sidetracked, and I've got to be careful. So, to, but let's go to Acts chapter 2. You know, all these things I'll get to come in my head, so. <laughs> Not everything is planned here, by the way. <laughs> I want to go back to verses 21 and 22. Actually, you know what? Yeah, 21 and 22. Of course, this is the day of Pentecost here. Here, and it should, and shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. By the way, 30 years later, approximately, the Apostle Paul preached the same message. He said the same thing. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It goes on to say here, verse 20, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate uh, counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Obviously, he's going to preach that you, you, uh, a message that whom you have taken, sorry, whom uh, being delivered by, sorry, but, 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 where am I here? You have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Obviously, those in attendance were complicit, ultimately. But Jesus willingly went to the cross in the obedience of the Father. But it's not a murder trial, because an individual is not on trial here. In the Old Testament, under the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, murder applied to an individual. Didn't it? Not to a corporate group. There's never in the, and nowhere in the Bible where a group of people are called or are referred to as a murder, murderer, if you will. Now, you could have murderers within that group. No, of course not. It's nonsense. Nonsense. All right. So, let me get to my message here now because I, I really I am pressed for time and I have to be careful. I want to, hopefully, this does not go beyond 11. Let me just get there. So today, because we have six baptisms, and over the course of the last uh, few services, I've touched on scriptural baptism and the several aspects of it. I've, um, I'm sorry, let me make sure uh, that's not the one I want. We've addressed the proper subjects, the proper candidates, and those are believers, right? Those have received the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. We've addressed the proper mode which is immersion by water. Well, you're immersed. It's not sprinkling. It's not pouring. We address what it symbolizes. And the gospel and, the, and, the, and baptism, rather, water baptism, symbolizes the gospel. It's a symbol. It's an ordinance. It's a symbol. The death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So today, and it will be in a two-part series here, I want to look at scriptural baptism, its administrator, who has the authority, and who has the authority to baptize? Its administrator, and who has the authority to baptize? And this will be, this will be in conclusion of our, right now, I we'll call it a five-part series on baptism. So I firmly believe that this morning, or this morning's teaching, is perhaps the most important and the most vital of the five parts, indeed. Now, concerning baptism, it is probably accurate to say that baptism has been the most divisive issue in Christendom throughout the last two millennia. I use the term Christendom because I throw Roman Catholicism under that umbrella. It's not Christianity, Christendom. There is a difference. Now, historically speaking, this much is true. But when it comes to baptism itself, the most divisive issue, particularly among Baptists today, is over the matter of of its authority, authority. Who has the authority to baptize? Who has authority to baptize? Who? So the question of authority in baptism or who has scriptural authority to baptize not only keeps members of other religious organizations, quote unquote, that call themselves churches, from joining a Baptist church by letter of com uh, commendation and transfer, but also actually divides Baptists themselves into two camps. And these camps are, quote, open Baptists, 
Open Baptists are Baptists who will accept the baptism administered by another non-Baptist organization so long as it was by immersion. Right? And by non-Baptists, I'm talking about those churches that, that do not hold to the, to the Baptist principles, if you will. Baptist principles. Now, I should have really brought my outline here of the, of the eight principles. It's actually 13 if you include the five fundamentals of the faith. One of them is, is basically the Bible is our sole authority of faith and practice. Another one is separation of church and state. Another one is the autonomy of the local church. A church is an assembly. It is a visible gathering. It's not some mystical, universal, invisible entity as many Christians uh, claim. It is actually assembly. When the Lord Jesus Christ said, Upon this rock I will build my church, during his earthly ministry he was building his church. It started with the twelve disciples and so on and so forth. And of course, after he was resurrected, those disciples went and planted other churches, which planted other churches and so on and so forth. Now, regarding open baptism among Baptists, about 16 years ago, it was probably 2006, 2007, I cannot remember the year exactly, Pastor Schoenhar had taken me over to Kitchener to Christ Away Bookstore, and after we went to Christ Away Bookstore, we went to meet Pastor David Axler from Ambassador Baptist Church in Bramford. I believe that church is now defunct. I don't know if he's alive or what he's doing now. But he basically wanted me to meet him because David Axler is a Jew who got saved and pastored a church. And of course, me being a Jew who got saved, he wanted, you know, wanted to want me to meet Pastor Axler, David Axler. Well, they, during that, when we had a meal lunch together, Pastor Schoener asked David, David Axler if, uh, you know, what kind of baptism he accepts. I don't know how that came into the conversation. So, but, you know, do you, do you accept any baptism, the Pentecostal baptism or any? And he said, yes. That's open baptism. That's open baptism. This church does not. We recognize that there is an authority. Because the thing is, when you accept the baptism, say, from a Pentecostal church, even though the candidate may be saved, although it was the right mode, immersion, although they may have had the right motive in obedience to God, the Father, you know, obedience to the Bible, rather, they had the wrong authority. And this is what I want to address today. The wrong authority. And we're going to address several aspects of why it's the wrong authority. And in the context also of the local church, keeping level, leaven from entering into the church. And that's one way to protect the church. Now the second camp is known as, quote unquote, closed Baptist. Just like we have closed communion in this church when it comes to the Lord's Supper. Very similar reasons. Why? Closed Baptists are Baptists who will only receive into membership people come from churches of like faith and order, i.e. other Bible-believing Baptist churches. Now, the prevailing opinion these days is that the authority in baptism is of no real consequence. In plainer words, the prevailing consensus, even among some quote-unquote Baptists, is that it matters little who does the baptizing as long as it is done. Now, sadly, this view will quickly lead to ecclesiastical anarchy by effectively opening the way to ecumenism. You hear that? Into denominationalism, lax standards, quote-unquote church hopping, etc. All of these things you open the door to. If the matter of who does the baptizing is of little consequence, then it stands to reason that the institution Jesus established during his earthly ministry and now perpetuates throughout this age will have been severely deprecated. And I've witnessed this today. I'm speaking of his church here. Matthew 16 and verse 18, he said this, And I also say unto thee, I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. By the way, Peter is not the rock spoken of here. That rock is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, if you compare scripture with scripture. And by the way, what is implied here is that not the gates of hell is coming against it, the, the church is beaten down upon it. The Lord's true church is actually beaten down against the uh, gates of hell. So I believe 
that throughout history you've had true churches. I do not believe the true church had to be restored and had come out of Rome. We are not Protestants. We are not reformers in this church. So authority in baptism is definitely important. We cannot dismiss this fact. It is essential to have the right administrator of the ordinance, a New Testament Baptist church. Now you may say that this is a narrow claim, and indeed it is, but there are reasons for it. And by the way, when I say Baptist, I understand not everything with every church with Baptist on the door is a Baptist church. I'm talking about Baptist principles. I am talking about Baptist uh, distinctives, if you will. So again, who has the authority to baptize? Well, the answer to this question, rather, comes down to another question. And that is, quote, to whom was the Great Commission given? And why for that matter? Well, because within this mandate is the command and thus authority to baptize. Now I would like us to turn to Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. And of course, here, the Lord Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, just prior to his ascension, was addressing the, tw the 11 disciples at that time, who I believe made up the church. There were others, but who made up really the leadership of that church especially. Matthew 19, 28 verse 19 says this, Go, that's a command, ye therefore, and teach all nations. So that is the preaching of the gospel. By the way, sometimes preaching requires a degree of teaching. You see that with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch was reading Isaiah 53, and it took Peter to expound on the scriptures to show him what it exactly was teaching. So go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That is discipleship. Keep that in mind. So you have the preaching of the gospel. You have water baptism. And then, by the way, water baptism, I want to make this clear, does not save your soul. It is not required for salvation. It is your identification with the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is your, your identification as a believer with the gospel. So whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you even unto the end. So again, you have the preaching of the gospel, water baptism, and discipleship. That is the order, the threefold component, or threefold aspect of the Great Commission. Now, if the authority to baptize was given in the Great Commission, then we need to ask ourselves again, to whom was the Great Commission given? Well, there can only be three possibilities. The first of which is the Great Commission was given to the Apostles. The first of which was that the Great Commission was given to the Apostles. Now the Great Commission was indeed de de uh, sorry, delivered to the 11 Apostles on at least one occasion. But if it, was to if, it was, sorry, if it was given to them only, then it stands to reason that it died with them and the New Testament plan for the world evangelism becomes a non-issue. Think about that. If it was only given to those 11 disciples, then it died with the death of John the Baptist, or John the, John the Apostle, around 96 or around 100 AD. Give or take a few years there. So keep in mind, or we need to keep in mind rather, the Bible does not teach apostolic succession. There are some that claim that they're apostles. We have the new apostolic reformation, which believes that there are apostles today and you know, apostolic succession, we have no evidence historically that this is the case. In fact, we have evidence from the Bible based on what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 to 15, that Satan has apostles. In fact, let's turn there. Let's turn there. Second Corinthians 11 and verse 13.
it. So Satan definitely has his apostolic succession. He does. For such are what? False apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Right? And no, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works, and their works are damnable. And they will lead those who follow their works right to the pit of hell. So again, we need to keep in mind that the Bible does not teach apostolic succession. There are three non-repeatable qualifications for an apostle. First, that he was an eyewitness of the resurrected Jesus Christ. There's not one person alive today who has witnessed the resurrected Christ. There's not one person been alive for 1,900 years. Absolutely. 1 Corinthians 9 verses 1 and 2 says this, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? It's the Apostle Paul speaking here. Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Obviously he was an apostle born in due time. 1 Corinthians 15. Let's turn there. I'll have you turn there. Verses 5 through 8. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 5 through 8. And that he, speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ, was seen of Cephas, that's Peter, then of the twelve, those are the disciples, after that he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. That means they died. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me, also as, one, as of one born out of due time. Over to Acts chapter 1 and verse 22. Acts chapter 1 and verse 22 it says this beginning from the baptism of John, that's John the Baptist, unto the same day that he was taken up from us. Must one, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection? Obviously, they're looking to replace Judas here. And they had to be a, a, a witness of his resurrection. They had to have seen the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. So firstly, an apostle had to have been an eyewitness of the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. This means there has there's been no one alive after the death of the apostle John around 96 AD who would qualify for this office. Now, secondly, an apostle had to have been audibly called by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And then thirdly, he had to have demonstrated the signs of an apostle. And we see this in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 12, where it says this, where Paul says this, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So the commission were given to the apostles, then it and the command to baptize is no longer in effect. Furthermore, it would also mean the apostles were abject failures because he never did go into all the world to preach the gospel to every creature. No. So therefore, it seemed obvious that the Lord's command to preach and baptize was not given exclusively to the apostles or the apostolic guild. Now, the second possibility is the Great Commission was given to individual believers. Individual believers. Now, of course, the New Testament church consists of individual believers. I understand that. And again, it's true that the commission was given to Christians as part of the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. But this is not what our Lord Jesus Christ meant when he gave it. The practicalities of any one individual filling it, making it an impossibility. We must keep in mind that the Great Commission is more than just soul winning. Indeed. 
would have to mean that if a Christian won a soul to Christ, keep this in mind when you think of the threefold aspect of the Great Commission, it would mean that if a, if a Christian won a soul to Christ, he could baptize that person, but he also must take responsibility to teach that, cur that convert all things. In other words, he must have, he must teach, he must continually disciple that convert. This alone is nigh on impossible. For one, if the Christian soul winner had died or moved, and he would have to move if he was to obey the first part of the commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel, some are sent. I understand some are set, but some are sent, sent out. In fact, recently, Mrs. Gappy's not here, I do not know why, but her home church or her, well, her first church there at, back in the Philippines in the, how do you pronounce it, Guagua? In Papanga there. Is it Papanga? Yeah, Papanga, sorry. Well, they've just ordained a man. So he said, like Pastor Joe Marquito sent me pictures and they, they sent me, uh, you know, the, the ordination council and everything. So they've ordained, they sent a man out to, to, uh, to, uh, to plant a church in the neighboring province of Bulacan. Again, sent out, sent out. By the way, it's a local church that's sending out a preacher. And I did ask him, they believe like we do in a closed communion. So many things. The only thing that they don't have is the dress standards. They don't have that. They don't have the same dress standards. We have much stricter dress standards. And I believe in the very strict, in very strict dress standards. I believe to be as separated from the world as we can be. I believe women ought to dress as ladies. I believe that there are garments that pertain to a man and there are garments that pertain exclusively to a woman. And they should not be blended in any sense. Many will argue, where well, do you see women shouldn't wear pants in the Bible? Well, it doesn't explicitly say women shall not wear pants. But if you think of the history of feminism, especially the more recent history, the 120 years or so, and you think how pants were introduced, it's, it's sort of that blend, if you will, the Hegelian dialectic, creating a blend. And so, or how, could, how else can I put it? It's kind of blurring the lines, the beginning of blurring the lines, creating this sort of, this shift, this paradigm shift of what's acceptable. And by the way, a woman always looks like a lady in a dress. She'll never look like a lady in the pants, even if it's a pants suit. She looks like some executive in a company. Anyway, we're not here to preach on dress standards per se. And again, that's a matter of your conscience when all is said and done. I can also preach on hair length as well, which some ladies in here are in complete disobedience. I will tell you that based on 1 Corinthians 11. I wonder if that's been extricated out of your Bible sometimes. So then, we can conclusively say the Lord's command was not given to individual believers outside the church setting and construct. Now this brings us to the third possibility, and that is that the Great Commission was given institutionally and not individually. And I believe this makes sense. Again, the Great Commission was given institutionally and not individually. This really is the only practical answer because it allows the work of the Lord to proceed on in an orderly and unbroken basis, in an orderly and unbroken fashion. This being the case, the next question, next question rather, that we must ask is, quote, to what institution did the Lord address this vitally important command? I strongly contend that the Great Commission was given to his churches. And there are two reasons why I two reasons rather why I believe this. Well, first of all, the Lord Jesus Christ only established his church. He did not found a multiplicity of religious organizations and agencies, but rather he founded his only one true church. Again, Matthew 16 says this. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now the second reason why I believe the Lord's churches are the institution, institution through which he gave the Great Commission is the fact the Great Commission was given in a church setting. It was given in the church setting. Now although shaken and somewhat bewildered, the 11 disciples of Matthew 28 and verse 16 were an assembly of baptized believers meeting with their risen Savior at an appointed place. Very much like what we are doing today. 
you have to understand the church is not this room. We can meet out in the streets and set up chairs right here in this parking lot. Or in a park on a good day. And Lord willing, in the summertime, I would like to do that. Meet in the park, maybe over here. I'd have to see, you know, if we get permission or what we have to do for that. Because I don't want to just go there and have the police show up and say, you know what, you need a... <laughs> so I'll have to find out. But I'd like to meet, or somewhere... That'd be nice, wouldn't it? In a nice, nice day, a nice summer day, under a canopy or something. I would like us to turn to John chapter 20, verse 19. John chapter 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciple, sorry, where the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he said so, he had said so, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. I hope you're glad. Then said Jesus to them, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Here the risen Lord Jesus Christ addressed the assembled, baptized disciples and said, As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. Which is the great commission expressed another way. Right? Go ye therefore is being sent. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the great commission was given yet again. Here the Lord tells his disciples when he says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea. I want you to keep in mind here, keep, take note of the word and here, and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. This can't be fulfilled with one person. Keep in mind the word and here. Keep in mind the world. By the way, after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That's Pentecost. And again, it says, And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts part of the earth. In fact, they were, they, 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 they were actually in disobedience of this commandment until the Lord brought persecution. I believe it's in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1 where they were scattered. So it's very clear here, the Lord was speaking to his church. Again, I want you to keep in mind, the church is an assembly. It's a called out assembly of blood-bought, scripturally baptized, born-again believers. To the assembled. So he's speaking to the assembled, baptized believers who come, quote-unquote, come together in the upper room. Acts chapter 1, I'd like us to turn there, Acts chapter 1, I'm going to read one, uh, verses 1 through verse 6. <clears throat> Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 1, the Bible says this, The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach, Unto the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles, whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. By the way, you can prove the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It can be proven in the court of law, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and... Being what? Assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For truly John, John, John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And by the way, we're not getting into the baptism with the Holy Ghost. That's different here. When they therefore... Come, by, by the way, this baptism was a one-time event, by the way. It happened at Pentecost. 
When they, there, when they therefore were come together, quote unquote again, come together. What is that, a church? What have we done here today? We have come together. They asked of him saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Again, they were looking for the kingdom, of course. And the Jews are still looking for the kingdom to this day. So it is for these reasons we can conclude that the Great Commission was given to the Lord's churches. This being the case then, this being the case rather, then only the Lord's churches have the God-given authority to baptize, seeing that baptism is one-third of the Great Commission that was given to His churches. Now, why? Now we're, gonna, now, we, now we're gonna address rather why authority and baptism is important. Why? The Lord Jesus Christ implied the great importance of authority and baptism when he sought John or sought out John the Baptist to receive his baptism. The, Christ, the scriptures tell us that he walked approximately, let's say, 100 kilometers from Galilee to Jordan to get baptized with what we effectively could call a Baptist baptism. We also need to be mindful of the fact that there were plenty of streams in Galilee, not to mention the Sea of Galilee itself. He could have easily have gotten baptized there, seeing that there were many believers in that region, or rabbis for that matter, there to perform it, if having the right authority was not important. He could have easily gotten baptized there. So we can conclude the right authority is important. So in the case of our Lord Jesus Christ, that authority was none other at that time than John the Baptist himself. Now I want us to note that John's title, the Baptist, is a God-given title. It's God-given. It's from heaven. It's not man-given. He was not called John the Presbyterian. He wasn't called John the Lutheran. He wasn't called John the Anglican. He wasn't called John the United Church Minister. Not even called John the Immerser, some claim, or some refer to him as. No, he's called John the Baptist. John the Baptist. John the Baptist had heaven's authority. Therefore, he preached and practiced and authorized baptism. Now I would like us to turn to Matthew 21, verses 23. We're starting in verse 23, but we're going to read through to verse 27. Now I fully understand that John, some would say John the Baptist was the last Old Testament prophet, but he was revealed in the New Testament. And I understand the apostolic era was a transition phase. It was. But that does not mean that the Lord's ecclesia did not exist. Did not exist during the, earth, the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 21, verses 23 through verse 27. And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Listen to this, I, will, I also will ask you one thing, which if ye tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. Listen to this, the baptism of John, whence was it? In other words, from where was it? From heaven or of men? You hear that? From heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, if we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, why did ye not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people. For all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, we cannot tell. And he said unto them, neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. We fear the people. Right? The fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be what? See? They feared the, they feared the people. You hear that? John the Baptist himself stated that his baptismal authority came for, directly from heaven. And this is borne out in John chapter 3, verses 20, 26 and 27. There it says, and I'll start with verse 25, by the way. 
Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from where? From heaven. Heaven. In Luke chapter 7 and verse 30, the divine authority of John's baptism is emphasized. And there we are told, starting in verse 29, And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John, but the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. You hear that? They rejected the what? The counsel of God. It's heaven's authority. In Acts chapter 1, the Jerusalem church acknowledged the authority of John's baptism when they stipulated that the successor to Judas must have, among other qualifications, received his baptism from John, John the Baptist. And there it says, Wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and, went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So even though they were under the law still, keep this in mind, all the apostles were effectively saved under the ministry of John the Baptist and received their baptism from him. Now the scriptures give us no record of them ever being baptized again. You don't hear that. Why? Well, the answer is quite obvious. It is because John's baptism was scriptural in every conceivable way. It was with authority. Next, we learn from the, from the apostles, from the Bible rather, that the apostles baptized with Christ's authority. They baptized with Christ's authority. During our Lord Jesus Christ's earthly ministry, it is, clear, it is crystal clear he authorized his disciples to baptize. John chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 says this, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but who? His disciples. So although they had no fixed location, the Lord's disciples were in every way a fully functional church fully functional New Testament church. You have to understand, at that point, they were not empowered. They were later empowered, but they were initiated already. Keep that in mind. Now, Philip baptized the Ethiopian eunuch with authority. So here's another example. It is often argued that Philip baptized the eunuch in an individual capacity. Hear this. And on the surface, this seems plausible. But when digging a little deeper, the question beckons. Did he? Did he baptize with individual authority? Did he? Did he baptize with individual authority? Well, when we go back to Acts 6 and verse 5, we learn that Philip was both a member and also a deacon at the church of Jerusalem. That's when deacons were first chosen. According to Acts 21 and verse 8, he was also an evangelist who was both a deacon of that church and an evangelist sent out. And this is what it says in verse 8 of Acts 21. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, the seven deacons chosen, and abode with him. We must keep in mind that both the deacon and evangelist are church functions. So it is reasonable to assume that he had church authority. I would like us to notice that he was careful to inform his church in Jerusalem of his ministry among the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8 and verse 14. And I would like us to turn there. I would like us to turn there. And we're going to bring, begin the account from verse 5 because I'd like to give us some context here. <clears throat> 
Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing, seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. And there was a great joy in the city. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. By the way, I believe these, type, these Simons are, are in our midst today. Greg Locke and various other people like that. These are the Simon, so Simon the sorcerers of today. Continue on here. Verse 10. To whom they, gave, they all gave heed from the great, least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. Verse 11. And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. Are you bewitched here today, friends? Verse 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. By the way, they believed means what? They got saved. They were saved and they were baptized. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. They heard that Samaria, Samaria had received the word of God. Who did they hear it from? Of course, a report was given back. Kind of like a missionary today. If you send out a missionary, they'll send you a letter. They'll send you a report of the work they're doing. Even Brother Tuyer, although he, he, he's the pastor of the church out there in the Philippines, he does send a report, I really should... You know, he sends it via messenger. I really should kind of, uh, and pictures, I really should every so often get them uh, or show them to you or have them put up or something like that. Maybe we can work on that. Moving forward now. Ananias in Acts chapter 9 baptized the apostle Paul, who was Saul at the time, with authority. There are many that claim that Ananias act on his own volition when he baptized Saul. In other words, he baptized them on an individual basis, outside the authority of a church. But before we jump to such conclusions, we need to consider the facts based on the account given us in Acts chapter 9. First of all, there was a church already established in Damascus. And the then unconverted Saul was going there to persecute and destroy it. Keep that in mind. He was going there to persecute a church. Acts chapter 9 verses 1 and 2 And Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the, to the synagogues that if he found any of this way whether they were men or women he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Next Ananias was a member of the church at Damascus. Perhaps he was the pastor although we cannot confirm this but perhaps verses 10 through 14 says this Next chapter, nine. and there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in the vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in the vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. And next, God had directly commanded or authorized Ananias. Verses 15 and 16 says this But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way. For he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. You hear that though, the threefold? You notice that there are those that claim that the Apostle Paul is strictly the Gentiles, but it says here, before the Gentiles and kings and, and the children of Israel, and. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. 
And then in Acts 9, verses 22, 22 verse, uh, or 18, rather, verse 18 through 26, the scriptures tell us that Paul became of the church at, Jerus at Damascus. He became a member of that church, rather. This is normal practice. After a person is saved, they are baptized into the membership of a church. And I want to make it clear, the membership is not like a gym membership. You're not going to be a card-carrying a card member of Grace Missionary Baptist Church once you have been baptized. It's in the context of the body. And a body has members. And each of those members have a function within that body. It's metaphorically speaking, in other words. And this is the pattern that we uphold here at Grace. Now later on we learn that Saul, who later, become Paul, who later was named Paul, sought to transfer his membership to the church of Jerusalem, or into the church of Jerusalem. Now I'd like us to turn to Acts chapter 9, verses 18 through 26. I'll be going a bit longer than 11.15 with this particular message, but that's fine. <clears throat> Acts 9, verses 18 through 26. And immediately, it says here, there fell from his eyes as, a, as it had been scales, and he received sight forth, forthwith, and arose, and was what? Baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples, which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue. He also got saved, baptized. What did he do? Preach Christ. Preach Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem, and came hither for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased them more in strength, and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying on weight was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in the basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. Again, we're, we're looking at examples of authority in the New Testament. In Acts 10, Peter baptized Cornelius with church authority. Peter baptized Cornelius, a Gentile, with church authority. Again, it is often pointed out that Peter baptized without church authority in Acts chapter 10. Uh, Acts chapter 10. However, Peter went to Cornelius with God's authority. In any case, it seems it was the men from the church at Joppa who actually baptized Cornelius. And this is borne out in verses 23 and 48. So what it says, Then called he them in and lodged them. And on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him, verse 48, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. <clears throat> of course, you can read the whole chapter there to get the context. So whatever the case may be, it is interesting to note that when Peter was rebuked by the church at Jerusalem in Acts chapter 11, it was not for baptizing without authority, but for eating with non-Jews. You hear that? Basically, uh, breaking kosher laws. Next example is Paul and Barnabas were sent with church, uh, with church authority. Churches sending missionaries and men out to plant churches is God's way. You hear that? Churches sending missionaries and men out to plant churches is God's way of doing things. That is, it is under the authority of the churches that men are trained and sent out. In Acts chapter 13, the missionaries, the missionaries were sent forth by the church at Antioch to establish other churches. Acts 14 and verse 23. They went forth bearing their church's authority to baptize. Now the church that Jesus built has long since passed from the earth, but before doing so, it gave birth to other churches of like faith and order. For example, the church at Antioch came from the church at Jerusalem. The church at Ephesus was born from the outreach of the church at Antioch. 
and at least 10 other churches in Asia came about as a result of the evangelistic efforts of the church at Ephesus. You hear that? It's the same pattern that we're doing today. It ought to be. By the way, it's not mission boards that are planting churches. That's not God's authority. I do not see that in the Bible. It's not parachurch organizations that have that authority. It is the churches, the local churches. Now, all of these churches have also ceased to exist, but not before their witness founded like faith and order churches throughout the regions beyond. Now, the authority of the churches to baptize is reflected in the fact that it is a church ordinance. Again, the authority of the churches to baptize is reflected in the fact that it is a church ordinance. We learned from our previous studies that Paul, when addressing the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 2, he commanded them to keep the ordinances, that's plural, that he had delivered to them. There are only two things Paul stated he delivered to that church, and that is the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 23, and that which baptism pictures, and that is the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3, or verses 3 and 4. Baptism is the keeping in memory of the gospel. Just as a photograph or video now keeps loved ones in our memory, the photo itself, of course, is not the loved one, but a picture of them, or the video for that matter now. But it's rather a picture. So baptism and the Lord's Supper are the two ordinances of the church. And this also, and this has also been the case historically, for that matter. By the way, they're not sacraments. They're not a means of grace. They're not a means of attaining salvation. They are ordinances to be observed. Your salvation, your eternal security in Jesus Christ is not dependent on the water. It's all in the blood. All in the blood. Now because baptism is an ordinance and because these ordinances were given only to the churches, then only New Testament churches have the divine God-given authority to baptize. Next, baptism is also the door to church membership. Again, as I explained earlier, we're not talking about a gym membership. We're not going to be handing out you a card with your name on it saying that you're a member of Grace Missionary Baptist Church. It's not that. So this is another contentious, contentious point by many. But we must realize that just as the new birth is the door to the kingdom of God, the family of God, so baptism is the door to church membership. And a clear example of this is found in Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. And I would like us to turn there. I'd like us to turn there. By the way, don't mind if the baby cries. That's the best sound, by the way. In this church, we don't mind crying babies. We want more of them in here. <laughs> Brother... <laughs> <laughs> I love more babies in this church. Hint, 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 hint. <laughs> Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word, they got saved. Were what? Baptized. And by the way, that's water baptism. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That is discipleship. That is the fruit of discipleship because what they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, their teachings. But only that, in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Fellowship's important, friends. Fellowship in the church is important. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, uh, the first part of that says this, For by one Spirit... Are we all baptized into one body? And I believe that's speaking of water. Some we claim spirit baptism, and I know they are. But again, what is that one baptism in Ephesians 4, verse 5? So when a, when a believer is scripturally baptized, he is baptized into that church body of Christ. And that body of Christ is not some mystical, universal, invisible entity. It is simply a gathering an assembly of called out, born again, scripturally baptized, born again believers. Body of Christ is a metaphor that Paul used under the, host, holy, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to describe the function of a church, what a church is. 
He was baptized into the body, into, the, into that church body of Christ. Colossians 1 and verse 18 makes it clear that the body is the church, not some invisible universal entity. Here's what it says. And he is, that's Jesus, he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Now today I'm not going to, I'm not going to get into a teaching on the church, whether it's local or universal, that's another message. So if a person is baptized into a church, it is evident that it can only be by the authority of that church. Furthermore, when one is baptized, he or she is submitting to the authority of that church in church matters. A believer from, what, from some man-made religious organization who refuses to be properly baptized is rejecting the authority of the church and would, best, or would be best kept out. So baptism, in a sense, is a two-way door in that it lets in many, but does keep some out. It does keep some out. Now lastly, the Lord in this current age works through His churches. I'm not saying that a lone ranger, the Lord can't use a lone, uh, a lone ranger doing his own thing. The Bible does say in Isaiah 55 verse 11 that the Word of, you know, the, that the word of God will not return void. Right? So the preaching of a lone ranger, some of you know some of our lone rangers, we do. In fact, my, uh, my mom shared me a post of someone you know who's out street preaching. He's a lone ranger. Someone close to you, but I'm not going to mention names here. You know already. And again, the, the word of the Lord is not going to return void. God can get, use, use what he's preaching to bring someone to Christ. And I'm certainly not going to deny that. But in this current age, the pattern, the orderly pattern, is through his churches. It's only through his churches that you can have proper order. You can have accountability. An individual is not accountable. So although the Lord blesses individuals, it is his plan that all Christian service and ministry be done in a church context under its authority. That way there is an element of accountability and order. Indeed. Indeed. Now the Bible tells us that each New Testament church is, first of all, the pillar and the ground of the truth. Verse Timothy 3 and verse 15 says this, But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how, to, how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Each New Testament church is the agency holding and using the keys of the kingdom. That is the gospel. Matthew 16 and verse 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. That wasn't given unto the Roman Catholic Church. And whosoever, whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Each New Testament church is the body responsible for sending forth evangelists, for sending forth missionaries. Acts 13 verses 1 through 3 says this, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch, the church, right? It's an assembly. Certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, and I may be pronouncing these wrong, I do apologize, which had been brought up with, the Herod, with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And as he ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me and Barnabas and Saul for the, uh, for the work whereunto I have what? Called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away again. I just, I just saw pictures of a young man being ordained and sent out to plant a church in Bulacan from Pampanga. Each New Testament church is the storehouse for the offerings of God. 1 Corinthians 16 verses 1 and 2 says this, Now concerning the collection, right, that's an offering, for the saints, as I have given order to the, hear this, the word order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye, church of Corinth, or Grace Missionary Baptist Church, if you want to give it a contemporary application. Upon the first day of the week, which we are now meeting on, let every one of you lay by him in store, that's the offering, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. That's why we take up an offering on Sundays. I know some churches take up an offering during the midweek, and lastly, each New Testament church is the custodian and administrator of the ordinances. 1 Corinthians 11.2 Now I praise you, brethren, 
that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances, plural, as I delivered them to you. Now, one of the strongest proofs that the authority to baptize is not vested in an individual is found in Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. And I believe we're going to be coming to a close soon. Let's turn there. Nineteen. This is one of the strongest proofs that the authority to baptize is not vested in the individual is found in this, in this portion of the scripture here. Let's start at 19 verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto them, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And he said unto John, Unto John's baptism. Unto. Doesn't mean that John baptized him. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, obviously, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When they heard this, means they got saved, by the way, here. They really, they truly got saved. And then they received the right authority for baptism. So they were baptized, but they had to be rebaptized here under the right authority, the right conditions. Now, the evidence of Scripture is that some person other than John the Baptist took it upon himself to baptize these 12 men. Apart from the time and distance factors, John the Baptist preached repentance and faith in Christ and about the Holy Ghost. In Matthew 3 and verse 8, he commands to, quote, bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance. And in verse 11, he says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, that is Pentecost, and with fire, that is hell. So the, Penteco the, the Pentecostals will say with fire, you know, you know, the Holy, you know, Holy Ghost baptism, or was it the, the baptism of fire with the Holy Ghost? No, it's actually speaking of hell. <laughs> Speaking of judgment, the Lord Jesus Christ is the keys to death and hell. So whoever baptized these men in Acts 19 did not know how to tell them to be saved. They didn't know the gospel. They didn't even know that there was a Holy Ghost, the person of the Holy Ghost. So you don't tell them how to be saved, much less the gospel. So it's quite evident when examining Scripture that baptism is one-third of the Great Commission. It's very clear. And that the Great Commission was given to the churches rather than, to, than only the apostles or any individual believer. Any individual believer. Heavenly Father, we give thee thanks for the blessing of thy word. And I trust, Lord, it would serve to help those, Lord, that have some questions here, Lord. And of course, Lord, I pray, Lord, give me the wisdom to teach the second part of this as we deal or delve into alien baptism, foreign baptism. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen.